This is Sound and Vision. I'm Emily Fox. Last Thursday was Music Heals Addiction and Recovery at KEXP. All day, DJs took requests and shared stories of songs that related to listeners' journeys of addiction and recovery. And this is a subject Seattle's own Macklemore has been open about in interviews now, and his music. Those three plus years I was so proud of, and I threw them all away for two styrofoam cups. The irony. Everyone will think that he lied to me and made my sobriety so public there's no f***ing privacy. If I don't talk about it, then I carry a date. A 08, 10, 08, then that was been changed. And so during Music Heals, KEXP's Gabriel Teodro spoke with Macklemore to have him share his story of addiction and recovery. Here's a portion of that conversation. Hey, hey, this is Early on KEXP. I am joined by a very special guest who a lot of people don't know. Uh, we have a history that goes all the way back to our teenage years. And he happens to be the most requested artist on days like this. Today is Music Heals, where we're talking about addiction and recovery. And it's my joy and pleasure to introduce my brother, Macklemore. How are you? I'm so good, man. It's so good to see you, Gabe. Always, always love, bro. Yeah, likewise, bro. So um, yeah, I thought we'd just hop right into it, man. Um, You are... One of the most, I would say, vulnerable artists when it comes to speaking on your struggles with addiction and recovery and how central that is to um, not just to your healing, but to you even like being here on this planet. And and as a musician, I wanted to ask you, like, how central is music in your path to recovery? And does it play a part? Yeah, music absolutely plays a part because music has always been my mirror. It's been my reflection. When I when I stare into a a blank piece of pa- paper, that is, you know, an open therapy session potentially for what I'm going through. And it gave me a means to process my own struggle early on before I was diagnosed as having the disease of addiction, of being an addict. And it was like, yo, I'm I'm trying to quit smoking or I'm trying to quit drinking. I'm just trying to quit something. Um, I can't do it. I know that I'm blocked. I know that my like my connection, my crown, my my tower is blocked to, to being a conduit. And I can't I can't channel it. I can't channel it the same way when I'm clean. And I also can't stop once I start. And. Before I went to rehab, before I, um, you know, started a 12 step program, it was the paper that motivated me to um, to see myself. And then also a huge component is that music gave me a purpose. So I knew that if I was going to make it in music and make it just meaning like make music at all or even give myself a shot to get a local show or whatever it was when I was a teenager that I I couldn't do that if I was blocked. I couldn't do that if I was high. So it was an immediate reflection of like, yo, if you really want to focus on your craft, if you want to be the best version of yourself to actually feel your heart, write lyrics that mean something, I have to be clear. Yeah, that's real. It reminds me, uh, (laughs) one of the lyrics that have kept me clean through all these years, I don't even know if I've said this to you, is is from Outkast, AT Aliens. Mm -hmm. Andre 3000 has a bar where he said, uh, no drugs or alcohol so I can get the signal clear as day. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was mm-hmm. listening to that before I was exposed to anything. And it was just kind of like a thought that, you know, I kept close to me. Right. Um, I love that. Yeah. You know, I, it's funny, we never talked about this, but I remember um, visiting you when you were in rehab in 2008. That's crazy. Yeah. That's me and Khalid. Is it, you guys did visit. I complete. I, we haven't, I haven't even thought about that for hella, bro. You guys did pull up to rehab. Yeah, and That's you crazy. came and and you came and stayed with me right afterwards. Like yep. you know, what I'm saying, like I was living in Vancouver. You were up in BC. This is a conversation that I think I wish a lot more people had publicly, and it's one that I think both of our traumas are wrapped up in it because we both have lost a lot of people um, yeah. to this disease. Yeah. I saw an interview recently where you shared a story that I had never heard about you guys got robbed after um, mm. after the heist came out. Your studio got robbed and mm-hmm. you uh, you came across the person again. Can you can you 
recount that story for KXP listeners that may not have heard. Yeah, of yeah, absolutely. That, that story was was incredible. Yeah, <laughs> it is an incredible story. Our studio was down in Belltown, towards um towards the water, and um. Ryan left the door ajar. Some some cats walked in and took everything or, or a lot of things. And, you know, we're talking about hard drives and, and guitars and microphones and, and just pulled the lick, got out of there with things that couldn't be replaced. And, you know, Trisha was distraught, my wife. Um, Ryan was distraught. He had, you know, accumulated these guitars and we were all super bummed. And Trisha was like, you know, we dealt with the police enough that Trisha was like, if we're going to find this stuff. We got to go take matters into our own hands and actually go, you know, because they're using credit cards and we're seeing that they're in different stores. And, and one of the guys had a red jacket. We ended up finding the guy at a bus stop with the red jacket who, who you know, had the same hat. And, um, you know, then called the police and the police arrested him. Sure enough, he had some of the things that were stolen. And the police asked us, do we want to press charges or do we want to give him the option to go to drug court and go a different route? Basically, like, do we want to uh, contribute to the incarceration epidemic that is happening in America right now and that always has been happening? Or do we want to give this guy a second chance? And, you know, because he was a heroin addict, you know, he had he had track marks and all of that. And um, immediately I'm like, no, drug court, absolutely. And that was kind of it. That You know, we got back whatever we had and, and didn't get back the rest of it. And that was the end. And um, I don't know if it was a year or two later, it was if it was a year or a couple years later, but I was in a meeting and some dude came up to me after the meeting and I had just relapsed. So this was my like home group and it was my like Tuesday meeting. This was the meeting that I ran. So like, you know, mm. I'm the one that, that opens up the door and makes the coffee and, you know, and it's like my community of people here on these Tuesday morning meetings. And I had to let them know that I had, that I had relapsed over the weekend. And it was super emotional, a lot of tears, a lot of pain. And, um, you know, still that guilt and shame of like, I can't believe that I did this again. And I'm trying to love myself through it. And people are after the meeting coming up to me talking. And this, this guy came up to me and said, you know, can I talk to you for a second? And I, I didn't recognize him. And I'm like, yeah, just, just give me a couple minutes. And he, he came up again. And I was like, yeah, what's going on, man? And this was in front of others. And he was like, can I speak to you in private? And I'm thinking like, he's a rapper. Like he's about to try to sell me his mixtape. Like, you know, like, let me get these bars yeah. off. And he pulls me um, to the side of the parking lot and he's shaking and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this piece of paper and he starts reading it. And he says, my name is such and such. And two years ago, I robbed your studio of things that I can never give you back. But what I want you to know is that I am on my ninth step right now. I have a year and a half clean and I am actively in the program and I've been free from heroin since I went to drug court. And like every time I tell the story, it's just like goosebumps. Um, and here I am with like, you know, 48 hours. And this yeah. guy that robbed me, we've like switched places almost because I'm, I'm broken. And he's the one that has been mm -hmm. doing the work that has been showing up that hasn't turned his back on the program in any way and is right there in front of me like I'm I'm making my amends to you. And yeah. um for those of you that that you know the the ninth step is a step where you make amends to any anyone that you have harmed, you know, that mm -hmm. you've caused pain. And you know, when you can, you do it in person. And he found out the meeting that I was at and did it in person. And um wow. It was a true testament of the power of recovery, bro. I was just like, mm -hmm. oh, my God. I just, like, you know, burst into tears, and we hugged each yeah. other. And I'm just like, you know, you see the transformation that is possible when people um, surrender and, and wave the white flag. And they're like, you know what? I can't do this on my own anymore. I need some outside help. I need a community of people that have the same thing. And, um, and I need to do some step work and he was obviously doing the work and I, you know, I, I haven't seen him since. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, if he was on his ninth step then and the way that he was talking, I'm sure that he's probably sponsoring people right now 
and um, wow. freely giving away what was given to him by somebody else. And that's the beauty of this program. It's an incredible story, man, that transformative justice, like in practice yeah. in public. And man, I thank you for sharing it with people publicly, too, because I feel like those kind of stories of real, like you know, real, like true restorative justice, you know what I'm saying, where the person is yeah. restored and you feel like that is it's so crucial and people don't talk about those wins you know that's a win you know no we focus on the l's we focus on the statistics and the l's and 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 yeah. unfortunately there are a lot of so many so many l's so many lives lost like constantly um yeah but yeah. when but when you do see it and and there's so many also w's like it, it's both it's life there's 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 both sides to it but i think that what i what i saw is that this is someone that has um has truly been restored and and that process should be celebrated always what are some words that you you would like to leave for listeners who may be struggling with addiction or who just may love someone who's struggling with addiction i think if you're if you're questioning whether or not you have the disease or, or you maybe know that you do, but you haven't done anything about it. And obviously there's so many different levels, you know, to the disease, but go to a meeting, Google right now, local AA, NA, MA, you know, any, any anonymous program and go to a meeting. And, you know, at the very least you, you, it, it eats up an hour of your time, but I can almost guarantee you, whether you have the disease or you don't, you will leave with more compassion. You will leave with restored faith in humanity. You will, you will hear stories and testimonies of people that has transformed their lives because they got open, they got honest, and they were able to really work on who they, who they are. This process is an excavation process. Whether you have the disease or not, we're getting to the root of our character defects. We're apologizing to people for things that we've done in the past. We work through these transformation steps. And then once we get to the 12th one, our job is to go pass it on to somebody else, the same way that the game was given to us. And that 12-step process is the most beautiful thing I have experienced in my life. And it's also available for those that are on the other side of it, Al-Anon, where if you have someone in your life that is that is struggling and you're trying to figure out how to show up and to know that I can still show up with love, that I can still support, but there's key things that we that we can help with and there's key things that enable if you're if you're mm -hmm. trying to show up for somebody else. And until we actually go to one of those Al-Anon meetings or, or or seek some professional help, a lot of times we're just shooting in the dark and actually not helping the problem at all. But contributing to it. That was Macklemore speaking with Gabriel Chiodros for Thursday's Music Heals Addiction and Recovery on KEXP. It's a day where we share listener emails and song requests, sharing their stories of addiction and recovery and the music that helped them through their journeys. And one of the emails that came in that day was from Seattle's Abby Simmons. Her story starts with Macklemore and ends by finding sobriety in the last place you'd think of, on tour. I was working on a last minute press release for Macklemore when I realized without a doubt, I was an addict and an alcoholic. Before the sold out arenas and the Grammys and thrift shop, Ben had DM'd me on Twitter and said he liked what he'd read, what I'd said about Other Side, his latest single. And he asked if I could help with a press blurb for a remix that was going to be released tomorrow with local Seattle artist Fences. I was a struggling music writer and I was touched that someone had read my words and appreciated them. So I said yes, of course, and closely and drunkenly listened to the words Ben had written. While I may not have struggled with the same things that Ben was writing and rapping about, I understood his words as if I had written them about myself. Get another bottle just to get a couple swallows headed towards the bottom. Couldn't get off it. Didn't even think he had a problem. Though we couldn't sleep without getting nauseous. Room spinning, thinking he might have sipped just a little bit too much of that cough syrup. I sat there and I thought, oh, darn. <laughs> this is me. This is doubtlessly me. And he had this line about limits that you would set for yourself, about how you would never do that drug. 
and how you end up doing it. And you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you have to think, what have I become? That rush, that drug, that dope, those pills, that crumb, that roach. Thinking I will never do that, not that drug. Growing up, nobody ever does until you're stuck looking in the mirror like I can't believe what I become. So I was gonna be someone, and growing up, everyone always does. We sell our dreams and our potential to escape through that buzz. Just keep me up, keep me up. Hollywood, here we come. And that was me every day in the mirror, wondering what I was doing. It was another two years that I drank after Other Side. And five and a half years after a nurse in a hospital had told me that I was an alcoholic and that I would die if I didn't stop drinking. She told me I was like a cancer patient turning down chemo. And I kept on drinking. Seven and a half years later, in February 2012, I had had enough. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was 31. I had no clear future except the bottom of the next bottle. And I decided to put it down. I had nothing going for me except music. I loved music with every fiber of my being. I had written a local music blog for the last six years with my best friends called Sound on the Sound. I had booked local shows at a venue, and I had worked with a small local music management company, and they were trusting me enough to get in a band van at the end of the month. It was 17 days from my last drink when I got in a band van in Portland, Oregon, and we headed east to start a tour in Lawrence, Kansas. My parents, my loved ones were freaked out. They said, of course you're not going to do this tour when I told them I couldn't drink anymore and that I was an alcoholic. But I told them, I've never drank on tour before. And Seattle was filled with places I'd gotten loaded at and people I'd gotten loaded with. And I was only staying a week just to see what it was like. Except it wasn't just a week. (laughs) Four or five days into the tour, I knew in my bones in the same way I had known listening to Other Side that I could not leave this tour, that if I did, I would wonder what if for the rest of my life, and that that was something that I could drink about for the rest of my life. So I called my parents and my boyfriend and said, you have to send my passport to Detroit. I'm going to stay for the entire tour. I'm going to stay for the full 30 days. During that tour, I hit 30 days with no drinks in Detroit where I met up with my passport. I drove across the country and saw 20 states I'd never seen. I saw the New York City skyline for the first time. I slept on motel floors and chased a tour bus and every once in a while got on stage with the band and sang along, scared out of my mind, completely sober. And this was just the start. This February, I celebrated 11 years since my last drink and since I found exactly where I'm supposed to be professionally and personally in live music touring. I've still never had a drink on tour and I've toured the globe with musical heroes. I've lived a life in sobriety that I would have never dreamed of while drinking and that I would have never dreamed of stepping in that band van that first time, 17 days after my last drink. I know it sounds crazy and people ask me about it all the time, but I know without a doubt touring and live music have kept me sober. I couldn't do my job drunk. And it has been a joy and a privilege to remember all of these beautiful moments I get to witness. And as I always tell my doctor, nothing ever made me want to drink more than a miserable office job. Oof, that story had me in tears, good tears, the first time I heard it. That was Abby Simmons, who has since gone on to tour manage or sell merch on tour for Destroyer, Slater Kinney, Charles Bradley, Page of the Lion, Courtney Barnett, Big Thief, The National, Maggie Rogers, and more. And you can tune into the entire day of programming for Music Heals Addiction Recovery. It's on the archive. You can find that on kexp.org. And that was Sound and Vision. If you like what you hear on the show, please do me a huge favor and help spread the word about this podcast. Share an episode with a friend. 
or take a moment to subscribe to, rate, and review the Sound and Vision podcast. You can also financially support this show with a $20 donation at kexp.org sound. Thanks for listening.